Good morning again. I'm so thankful for our worship team who has uh, been so uh, flexible during the pandemic and continues to give um, beautiful music, even though it's been so hard for us to sing together. But I am so glad to be singing together again. Um, singing Love Lifted Me with this congregation uh, uh, was such a, a beautiful bookend for me because that was my favorite song growing up. And I'd forgotten about it, um, hadn't sung it in probably 10 years, visited my dad's parish in Texas last Sunday, and they sang this song from the old brown Cokesbury Methodist hymnal. And so I wrote it down as, uh, I, we have to sing that in my first Sunday back from vacation. Um, so I appreciate um, everybody for, uh, once again, allowing Robin and I to take um, vacations that is not uh, necessarily uh, a given at, at different parishes, and a lot of pastors get worn out because they don't have a chance to rest. So um, thank you for that ministry that you give to us. Will you pray with me before, um, before I preach this morning? God, be with me as I preach this morning, and be with all, all of us here as we listen for your still, small voice. Um, let us in all things seek what you would have us do. Um, as I preach this morning, let me be filled with your spirit. And let all of us be filled with the spirit of listening. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a famous hymn writer who grew up in the 18th century in England who had the fantastic name, Augustus Toplady. Augustus Toplady. Was there a more British name than Augustus Toplady? He was born November 4th, 1740. Um, in the 1740s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was a revolution going on in England. There was a push for more religious freedom apart from the, the strictures of the Anglican church. And from this, you get the rise of Calvinism in England. Um, Calvin was a theologian who held in an idea of predestination, the idea that all of our actions were preordained in the book of life. And that all people who were saved were saved before time began. So there was this, this uprising of an idea of predestination, even the idea of double predestination, the idea that even before human beings came to earth, God had decided who was saved and who was not. And largely in response to this religious teaching um, rose the Wesley brothers, Charles and John, who brought a different idea of grace, the idea of free will, the idea that we freely choose God's saving help, and we freely receive God's grace through um, the means of grace, communion, Bible study, prayer, fasting, tithing, charity, and the list goes on. So Top Lady is born into this theological argument. And um, one day um, uh, when he was moved by circumstances, um, financial circumstances, with his mother to Ireland, he attended a, uh, a barn preaching, um, outdoor preaching festival, uh, which was very common in those times. Um, also, um, we can thank John Wesley for those outdoor preaching festivals. Um, and while he was at Trinity College in Dublin, he, he heard um, this barn preacher um, who was not a learned person, but who spoke of the need um, for God's saving help in all of our lives. And he was convicted that he was called to ministry. It says um, in a, uh, a biography of Top Lady that the, 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 the preacher was preaching from Ephesians 2, chapter 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. This preacher was named Morris. They were illiterate, but their forcefulness of preaching made Top Lady realize how much he needed God in his life, how much he needed the saving help of Jesus. And after this, he became a partisan Calvinist who wrote attacking the Wesley brothers in really kind of vociferous language. And he wrote dozens of hymns that were very popular with Anglicans in England. He became known as a hymn writer. Um, the contemporary hymn writer of his time um, was Charles Wesley, who wrote 
literally hundreds of hymns. Um, but Top Lady was very popular, and people would sing his songs in churches. Imagine being a preacher and writing dozens of songs and knowing that those songs were sung across the entire island of England while you're preaching. So he was kind of like a pop star of his time. He was a celebrity preacher. People knew his songs and they sang them at their, their local churches. There's a hint um, that towards the end of his life, Top Lady um, may have, just such a great name. Can we just stop and recognize how great? I almost laugh every time I say it. That Top Lady um, came to agree with the Wesley brothers on, on one count. Because one of his most famous um, hymns um, has the, the striking line, be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. The idea being that, that um, he believed that, that it was Christ that, that saved him doubly, saved him at the time of the cross, and also saved him at the point when he recognized his need for God's help. So he saved you then, and he saves you now. And it seems that that was the, the theological um, worldview that, that Top Lady lived out the rest of his life. He didn't live much longer um, after he, he penned those words in 1776. A biography of, of Top Lady um, wrote about his, his fame. It burned bright like a candle, and then it was gone. Uh, he wasn't very famous uh, for the rest of his life, despite having written dozens of hymns. Um, only one remained. The biographer said, year by year, the number of his hymns and use in churches became less. He is no poet or inspired singer. He climbs no heights. He sounds no depths. He has mere vanishing gleams of imaginative light. His greatness is the greatness of goodness. He is a fervent preacher, but not a bard. They don't write biographies like they used to. <laughs> I think we could take a, a, a leaf from uh, the, the notebook of biographers from the 18th century. What flair. So at the end of his life, just a couple of years before he died, Augustus Top Lady was uh, walking um, in a, a rock formation in England, just outside of Somerset, England, known as Burrington Combe. And if you go, I've had the opportunity to travel in this part of the country. In between the roads are these enormous limestone rock formations that jut out at extreme angles. And there are caves that run throughout these limestone formations that have housed human beings for something like 15,000 years. And while Top Lady was walking, a storm came up quickly. And the downpour was so torrential that he feared for his life. And he ran deeper into the Burrington Comb and found a, a cave, a naturally occurring cave, that he took shelter in. Perhaps um, ancient human beings themselves took shelter in these caves as their permanent dwelling places. But while Augustus Top Lady was there under this, these enormous, timeless rocks, he found the gratitude for his continued existence in the midst of this torrential downpour. And he took a playing card out of his pocket and a, a, a little bit of pen and ink, and he wrote down the, the words that, that we know in this timeless hymn that, that remains even beyond him. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. This vivid imagery still resonates with us today. In this hymn, we say the rock of ages is Christ who clefts for us, who, who makes an opening for us to, to hide within so that despite the, the, the torrential rain outside and, and the dangers of the world, we can find refuge in Christ, this rock of ages. How much more does it add to the poetic beauty of the song to think that, that he, in that moment, was literally seeking, uh, seeking shelter in the cleft of a timeless, ageless rock? As I mentioned earlier, during my um, study week, uh, leave the last two weeks, and really um, for the last three or four months, 
um, I've been contemplating um, the idea of ecology. Ecology comes from the Greek word for home, oikos. So literally, ecology is the study of our home, where we live, and we live on the earth. And what I'm struck with at the end of these studies is that the earth itself, the place that we find our home, is itself a cleft of rock in a stormy void of an um, unforgiving universe. We are designed and have evolved to live here. And this place is such a perfect home that there's nowhere else in the universe that we have found that we could safely live. It is a cleft of rock that protects us. But as our brains continue to evolve and as we continue to understand our place in the universe and our place on this earth, we realize that our very presence here um, has led to problems that threaten the continued existence of our species. Our very success as a species has led to the very real danger that we might overstay our welcome on this small cleft of rock and we might find ourselves unable to continue to inhabit this earth. The gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Mark chapter six. And we meet disciples who come to Jesus exhausted. They report back to their supervisor the things that they have taught and the things that they've said and the places that they've gone, the people that they've healed. And they're so worn out, it says that they have hardly had any time to eat. Any parents in the audience ever find themselves at the end of the day realizing that they haven't eaten because they've been so careful taking care of their own children that they've neglected to take care of themselves? So what does Jesus say? He says, get in the boat. Go and find a desolate place a place with nobody, and rest a while. So that's what they do. But no sooner do they land in this desolate place than the news of their arrival hits the, the cities and the towns and people flock from wherever they are until there's a multitude of people numbering more than 5,000 people. Think about it. How, how few times are we in a place with uh, 5,000 people in it? 5,000 plus people. Maybe a concert, maybe some sort of like a political rally or something. Think about it. How, how rarely are we in a place with 5,000 people in it? But when you are in a place with 5,000 people, the needs are great. Um, I have um, put on several um, outdoor concert festivals through different jobs that I've had. And you would be shocked at the logistics that go into finding a place that 5,000 people can safely stay. People have to go uh, to the bathroom somewhere. So you have to rent bathroom facilities. People have to be fed. People have to drink things. People have to find shade. People have lots and lots of needs. And we already know that the people who followed Jesus were the sick, the people who needed um, direction, people who needed healing. So add to that all these compounding problems and the disciples who are already exhausted come to Jesus and they say, send them away. Please, Anybody, any other parents ever felt that way? Send them away, please. He says, the disciples say to them, they're hungry and we don't have enough to feed them so you should send them away. And Jesus responds with, um, in, in Greek, it's only two words. In, in English, it's, it's three. But it still has the, the, the forceful brevity. You feed them. You feed them. When Jesus is met with the needs of the assembled crowd, the disciples say, we need food to feed them. And he says, you feed them. Indignant, the, re the disciples respond, how could we send them out into the surrounding towns to uh, buy them food? We'd need 200 denarii to do this. It's kind of lost to us how much 200 denarii is, um, but it's basically a whole year's salary. So whatever you make in a year, that's how much Jesus said to spend to feed this assembled crowd of 5,000 people. And the disciples say, you're off your rocker, Jesus. JC, we've been following you this whole time, man, but if you think that we can just summon up 5,000 uh, uh, lunches, you're out of your mind. 
That's a, a bridge too far. I know we've seen you at this point bring sight to the blind. We know that we've seen you raise people from the dead. We've seen you heal people, but 5,000 lunches, that's the logistical boat. That is just too far. It was too much. That was the straw that broke the camel's back for the disciples' faith in Jesus. And he says, what do you have among you? And the disciples respond, five loaves and two fish. And then Jesus does his, one of his most famous miracles, one of the miracles that exists in all four Gospels. It's a rare thing to find a story of Jesus that is in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000 is there. And it says that he took that meager lunch, raised it up, gave thanks for it, and broke it, and passed it to his disciples, who distributed it to the crowd who had been pre organized in groups of 50 and 100, and it says that they fed them until all were satisfied. And then there was so much left over, there was so much abundance, that there were 12 baskets full of the remnant. Does that sound familiar to anybody? He took the bread, and he lifted it up, and he gave thanks for it, and he broke it. What is that? What is that? Sound familiar? It's our liturgy for communion, it's liturgy for the Eucharist. Eucharist means to give thanks. So he lifted it up and he gave thanks for it and he broke it. And this is mirrored later when Jesus breaks the bread, passes it to his disciples and says, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. So just as the disciples created from their meager supply an abundance that was available to the entire simple crowd, Jesus later says, you who are gathered here, you take from the abundance of my own body. I am enough for those here, but I'm also enough to satisfy the hunger of the world. I think it's really interesting that there's Eucharistic imagery in the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospel of Mark, which is our oldest gospel account, was written just some 20 years after Jesus' death. Within 20 years of Jesus' death, the Eucharist was already foundational to the church. It was such a foundational um, liturgy within the church, such as a foundational ritual within the church, that it's riffed on in the middle of the story of Jesus' most famous miracle. And I think ultimately what this is about, what the story is about, and what the Eucharist is about, is about thankful abundance. Recognizing that what you need to survive is already within your midst. The disciples came at the problem from a practical perspective. You might even say with a good business head on their shoulders. Anybody who's ever run a business or a corporation or a church or a family knows that only with good budgeting are you going to make it. They come with that common sense principle. They say, hey, Jesus, it's all good and fine that you want to be a hippie healer, but somebody has to pay the bills. How are you going to get this done? And Jesus says, don't look to the surrounding cities and towns. Look at what you already have and recognize that what you already have is enough. What you already have is enough to overcome the obstacles that are before you and the needs of the people that come to you for ministry. If there's a theme of my study leave between reading about trees and reading about Lord of the Rings and, and J.R.R. Tolkien and about how that came about, I think that the, the theme that um, is the red line between those two ideas, the idea of ecology and the myths that we tell about ourselves and where we came from, is the idea that progress at the expense of our own home is not progress at all. We have progressed so much as a species in the last 12,000 years. There are human fossils that are 100,000 years old. But only in the last 12,000 years did we switch from being hunter-gatherers to organizing in cities and then later into townships and countries and 
the progress that was needed to feed that many people led to an agricultural revolution. And you might say that the pinnacle of this agricultural revolution happened about 100 years ago when we fully shifted into a farming economy in America. And in just 100 years of farming the land, colonists and colonizers came from Europe to America, found people living here who lived here peacefully with the land for thousands and thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, without destroying the land, they found a way to live and to feed their families and their communities. European colonizers came, raised all of our natural forests, applied European agricultural techniques to a new country that was not suited for those techniques. And within 100 years of agriculture, we've destroyed 50,000 years of topsoil. Remember the American Dust Bowl? The calamity that happened just before the economic calamity of the Great Depression was one of the erosion of topsoil. Without topsoil, you can't farm. Without farming, you can't feed the masses of people that that type of farming was designed to feed. And what you're left with is not enough. We looked at the way that the native peoples lived, and we looked at the ways that we had lived in our home countries before colonization happened, and we said, no, we need to look to the expanding horizon. We need to expand west. And as we expand, we need to organize the, the unorganized forests. We need to bring order to this natural creation where we find what we see as chaos and bring order to it. We as at that time Christian men need to get, take our God-given authority as caretakers of the land and farm the entire country. And what that's led to is that we only have 1% of undisturbed forest left in the redwood forests of California. That's all we have left, 1%. And some of these trees that you see are magnificent. 2,000 year old trees that grow like skyscrapers in the sky. Looking at pictures, it boggles the mind to see human beings standing next to these redwood trees. And it's, it's amazing that we could see something that is so clearly ancient and turn it in our minds and say, okay, how can we turn this into something that we can make a profit off of? In the name of progress, we cut down so many of those amazing ancient trees and turn them into lumber to continue our progression as a culture in our country, but progression at the cost of the, the wellness of our home isn't progression, it's madness. The book that um, I read that probably most affected me during my study leave was the novel The Overstory by Richard Powers. It was published in 2018, it won the Pulitzer Prize. And Robin's husband, Andy, recommended it to me. And he didn't give me the best pitch. He said, it's a 600 page novel about trees. I said, I think I'll pass. It was one of the most engaging books that I've ever read and it was an empathy expanding book. There are moments that I can point to in my life as moments where it was almost like a book opened up in my life and suddenly I cared about things that were already there and I'd already seen in ways that I hadn't thought about. I could go back to um, when I was a child and I was, I was taught in Sunday school about God and about Jesus and there was an expansion of my understanding from my local family to understanding a church family and a group of people that I was spiritually connected to. That was an expansion of empathy. In college, when I first started reading about LGBT issues and the ways that I was wrong and the way that my church growing up was wrong and the way that I was taught and how it was wrong, there was an expansion of empathy. Again, in seminary, there was an expansion of empathy around race when I was forced for the first time to critically think about my position in the world and the way that my participation in the world led to the subjugation of people of color. And now there's this expansion of empathy once more for the natural world and especially trees. 
trees don't have rights the way that human beings and animals do, but why not? Why shouldn't they? Churches have rights, individual congregations have rights, but if we're ever taken to court, the church building doesn't stand up on its foundations and walk to the courthouse, does it? No. Lawyers argue on behalf of the well-being and the rights of the church, which is more than the sum total of its parts. Amen? The same way a college or university, if it's sued, does not stand up and go to the court by itself, but instead lawyers stand up and argue for what is best for that institution, that, that college or university or corporation. I think in the same way, we need to expand our understanding of the natural world to afford other living beings the same rights and privileges to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that we would apply to ourselves. Did you know that we share one quarter of our DNA with trees? One quarter of the genetic information that makes you is present in trees. We share not so distant ancestors with a tree. A tree is less a thing that we look at and more a cousin that we've lost touch with. We are not observers or conservers of nature. We are a part of nature. And we who survive in this cleft of safe rock in an unimaginably dangerous universe are left with two questions. What is the cost of progress? If we continue to progress as a species to the point where we can no longer inhabit our home, that's not progress. And last, what is the source of our safety? Augustus Top Lady found himself in the midst of a torrential downpour, fearing for his life, and he sought refuge in a cave. And there he wrote those famous lines, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. He recognized that just as he needed the physical protection from the downpour underneath this rock of ages, he also needed the saving help of Christ. We are met with a problem of our times. If COVID has taught us anything, I think it's the fragility of the structures that we have built up to support ourselves. Any, any support or structure that we would make for ourselves is fallible, be it from famine, be it from pestilence, disease, torrential downpour, freak of nature activities that, that happen beyond our control? What is the true source of our security? The true source of our security is God who lives within and among us, a God of abundance who gave us everything that we need to survive within us. Any time that we look outward for a source of our security, all that we need to do is return our gaze back to ourselves and realize that the source of our safety and the source of our strength has already be given, been given to us. So we're met with these two questions. What is the cost of progress and what is the source of our safety? I hope that as a church, we will look at this looming financial or uh, ecological crisis and give it the same attention that we would give if our own church building were in danger of collapse. If this church building, the edifice of this church, were to be in danger, there would be sleepless nights until it were fixed. How much more do we need to protect the, the rock of ages that we live on this ecological crisis that we're facing needs to be given the same attention that we're giving every social issue, but also if we found out that our beloved church building itself were in danger of collapse. Amen? And from this, we need to remember that the source of our safety is not our own intellect. It's not our, our human minds, our ability to, to um, come together and, and tackle hard things is an important part of who we are as human beings. 
but ultimately the source of our ability to fix these great problems that we're faced with. When we come to God and we say, this problem is too big, how can we fix it? It's beyond our means to provide. God says, you feed them. You feed them. When we see our world that threatens to crumble around us, when we worry about the future of our children or our, our children's children, and we attempt to pass the buck to God or to some future generation, I think that God looks at us and he says, you solve it now. What you need to solve the problems before you has already been given to you. You feed them. You solve it. I hope that we will address the, the problems that face us with the same theological sophistication of Top Lady, Augustus Top Lady, who realized we need the help of God, but we also need to use the things that God gave us. We need to use the facilities that God gave us to solve these incredible problems. Amen.